Oh, baby. Only we can do it like that. Keep the chains moving like that. Break a record with a nice pass. Only Drew can do it like that. Watch me out and work him like that. He ain't have to hurt him like that. Throw that thing deep the mic, yeah. All right, Saints fans and who that's from all over the world. This is Kyle T. Mosley of the Saints News Network with Bob Rose, and we present to you the Bayou Blitz tonight. Bobo, how are you? I am terrific, Kyle, uh, especially after yesterday. I uh, hope you and the family are doing well. And as always, happy Wednesday on a Monday, fans <laughs> of the Bayou Blitz, fans of the NFL, and especially fans of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, I think Mr. Mosley and myself are riding a high, just like our team is after a big, big, big win over the New Orleans Saints yesterday, uh, excuse me, uh, after over the Seattle Seahawks yesterday. Uh, joining me, as always, is my partner, my mentor, my friend, and Teddy Bridgewater's dance instructor, Mr. <laughs> Kyle Mosley. <laughs> hey, let the haters hate go on, Teddy. Go on, brush your shoulders off. <laughs> brush your shoulders off, Teddy. Oh, man, people were hating all week long, even some of our fans in Who That Nation. But Teddy proved them wrong like I thought he would. Uh, it was just a great game plan but it was a great team win i thought that was the most important thing that came out of the win up in seattle and remember i changed my 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 feeling about the game when we were making our predictions at the toward the end and i was right on target man i was right on target you know um those two touchdowns toward the end for seattle were kind of garbage touchdowns Still too close for me, <laughs> but um, it, it was right where I think the Saints need to continue to really manage the game, manage their personnel. Guys, if you're expecting Mr. Drew Brees to be out on the field, Teddy Bridgewater is not that. He's Teddy Bridgewater. So get used to him, get used to Taysom's role, get used to the Saints, because I think uh, coming in town, you have a Cowboys team, which, in my opinion, really haven't played anyone to the level of the Saints yet. So we'll see how Mr. Dak Prescott, Amari Cooper, Zeke, and all those boys uh, come out from Big D to the Big Easy. Yeah, for sure. And you know, first of all, I, I, I know when I made my official prediction, not only on our show last Wednesday, uh, but also in my game game day morning article, uh, when I predicted uh, Seattle to defeat the Saints, uh, I was on the fence about it. Uh, I was hoping and praying I was wrong. But despite that, I got called out by some of my uh, loyal followers. And I love you all. <laughs> but I got called out on Twitter anyway. Uh, so I'm standing here with a little bit of egg on my face over the prediction itself. But, Kyle, that's what we do. Uh, and I, I've never been so happy to be proven wrong. Uh, like you, I was really – I was intrigued uh, at what kind of game plan the Saints would have going into this Seattle game. Uh, and it was pretty much – textbook how you and I kind of laid it out last Wednesday. Uh, not that Coach Payton listened to us at all, uh, but that's just how much confidence we had in him uh, and in the talent on both sides of the ball. Uh, and as I, say, uh, as I said in my article, uh, when, you know, which was actually titled uh, you know, How the Saints Out-Seahawked the, the, the Seattle, they went into Seattle, one of the tougher road venues in the NFL, uh, and certainly a house of horrors for this Saints team over the last handful of years. Uh, and they really, they won the game in the way that Seattle usually does. They made plays on offense when they had to. Uh, they played very physical and intense defense despite giving up the yardage. And they were solid on special teams all day long. I know Deontay Harris had that fumble, had that, uh, yeah, fumbled pump. Uh, but outside of that, he had a handful of great returns uh, outside, of course, of his opening 
uh, punt return for a touchdown, which got the Saints rolling in the first place. Uh, but the team had outstanding special teams coverage. And, you know, can we say anything more uh, good things about Thomas Morstead? The man is the best punter in the league. Uh, I know it's weird to call a punter clutch, uh, but if such a term applies for the position, it certainly fits Mr. Morstead to a T. He kept Seattle pinned back deep in their territory all day long, uh, six punts with an average of 54 yards per punt, uh, and he, he put the Seahawks in position to have to drive the length of the field. Uh, and that's one of the one of the reasons that I said that the Saints out Seahawks Seattle because that's what Seattle usually does. They play the field position game, especially at home, because their philosophy is we're going to make you drive the length of the field because we have confidence that our defense is going to make the play before you score. And that's what happened all day long for the New Orleans defense. You can't give enough credit either to especially Demario Davis. Uh, you know, but that despite having no sacks on the day, the Saints pass rush got to Wilson, got him on the move, and the secondary held up just well enough. Uh, really didn't give up many deep plays down the field, other than when you point, like you pointed out, Kyle. Uh, you know, when the when the Saints already had a twenty point lead, they got lax in coverage. The Saints did get lax in coverage just a little bit, uh, but a lot of those passing yards and total yards that the Seahawks got. Uh, you know, they, they were with, they were after the Saints had already had a sizable lead, uh, and they were just intent on not giving up a, a back-breaking big play to get, get Seattle back in the game, and I thought they did an outstanding job of just that. Yeah, outstanding job by the Saints, outstanding job about, uh, trying to really limit Seattle from, uh, the big plays early on. And an outstanding job by our defense, uh, causing Seattle to miss Q three times on fourth down as well. Now, let's go back to Thomas Morstead. Man, Thomas was so good, the NFL drug tested him after the game. I, I heard that this morning. Isn't that something? He was so good. They were like, uh, uh, no, he's got something's got to be wrong. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Morris said that was a funny, funny, funny note. Uh, but I know they had to do their due diligence. Uh, Sean Payton really did a pretty great job. Now, we know Alvin Kamara is a great talent. Mm-hmm. But when you looked at what he did and how he performed, the balance is just superb. And all that training that he went through on the offseason to maintain his balance, his focus, his strength, his lower body strength, it showed and it showed so well against the Seahawks. And like Brian Baldinger called him, he calls him Cat Daddy now. <laughs> he said, <laughs> "He said Alvin Kamara should be called Cat Daddy. He's like a cat on a marble table. <laughs> Nobody can get to him." <laughs> so um, I, I really have to commend him. Really have to commend Cam Jordan for, as well as Davenport. And Trey Hendrickson, uh, and as well as Big O, too, man. Big O performed really yep. good. Uh, they put constant pressure on Mr. Russell, but, you know, he's Houdini. He's going to get away. He's going to find a way to disappear. And uh, but and Demario Davis, man, what can we say? That guy is just a consummate performer. He took over the, uh, I guess, the, the, the pump him up series for drew uh you know he got the 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 guys into the spirit at the beginning of the game and he continued on and he performed like he is a captain of that squad so on if you look at what the saints did well great i still got some issues and we still have some issues like you said bob with the defensive backfield in my opinion, now Eli Apple did a great job knocking out that ball, but he still was trailing, yeah. right? Let's let's get that right. Um, if time didn't run out before the second half, launched Mashawn Lattimore still gave up a big play, two big plays. No, was it three big plays? He gave up what well, Lockett a couple of times, right? So there's still some work to be done there. Um, was it a perfect? 
game, no, we did not have a perfect game, but we did what we have to do, and now I think it's going to have to be the model going forward until Drew gets back is to be able to go ahead and score often and early in these games. Yeah, for sure, you're right. Uh, and uh, yeah, in in regards to the secondary, uh, first of all, uh, let's take a hat off to Marcus Williams. I thought Marcus played his best game of the season so far. Uh, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember, folks. Uh, on I don't remember. I think it was the Seahawks' last drive. Uh, they actually intercepted Russell Wilson two separate times, uh, and each play came back because of a penalty. Uh, but one of them was Williams. Uh, he played outstanding in run support, and uh, particularly early on in the game, outside of that final drive, uh, drive of the first half that Seattle had, uh, yeah, he, he being the free safety is primarily responsible for the big plays over the top that had plagued the Saints over the first two weeks and much of last season. Uh, and I thought Marcus played his best game of the year. Uh, you know, Lattimore and Apple, uh, it's not that they played badly, like you said, Kyle, but they were inconsistent. Uh, and, you know, people do forget uh, that if the Seahawks had managed the clock better at the end of the first half, that game would have been 20 to 14 going into halftime, uh, or at least 20 to 10, uh, which could have been a different outcome. Uh, but, you know, it truly, like you pointed out, Davenport, Cam and Trey Hendrickson, along with Onyemata up the middle, uh, they did a terrific job all day long of moving Wilson out of the pocket. Hey, when we broke down this matchup last Wednesday, you and I, uh, we both said uh, that we feared Russell Wilson's ability to escape and make big plays on the move much more than we feared any individual weapon within Seattle's receiving or running back core. Uh, and, you know, and Tyler Lockett did have a big game, but a lot of those catches came down the stretch when Seattle was throwing the ball pretty much on every down. Uh, yeah, they, they didn't let Russell Wilson kill them. Uh, and that's what you and I were worried about going in. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think that this defense can take a lot of positive things away from this matchup. Uh, as far as my worrisome point on the defensive side of the ball, we talk about Drew Brees being missing from the offense and how much that's going to change the offensive scheme. And it for sure did. Uh, but how about what Alex Anzalone can bring to this defense and the fact that he was out of the lineup? Thank God for Demario Davis uh, playing such outstanding football because A.J. Klein continues to struggle. He just can't get sideline to sideline to make plays. And a lot of times when Wilson was on the move, I noticed anyway that they would use Klein to spy him. And Wilson's going to win that matchup every single time. Uh, you know, Chris Carson, the Seahawks running back, uh, beat Klein to the outside a few times too. Pro uh, yeah, and, did. Yeah. Uh, it was What's that? It was pro site. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, sorry, I got my running back wrong. Uh, but yeah, you know, AJ continues to trail, uh, and that's that's going to be a possible vulnerable point uh, for this Saints defense at least until Anzalone gets back in the lineup. Nope, nope, uh, I'm not nope. sure if Kiko yeah. Alonso is the answer or not, but they they need to do something to to cover up for that liability uh, well, as far as the defensive scheming goes. Yeah, well, Bob, I'm sorry to say. But Anzalone is shut down for the year. Uh, they announced it a couple of days ago that Anzalone had to have his surgery repaired. Uh, they okay. went back in, and he is out for the rest of the season. Hey, look, we got uh, Brendan Boylan from the Butler's Pantry and the Saints News Network on the air with us. Uh, so let's trying to get his thoughts uh brendan what's your thoughts about uh what's happening with the saints linebacking core with alonzo who may have to take over most of those duties because aj klein is a little in decline at this time well it's been a long time guys so hey how you doing brendan? Uh, too long. i'm good i'm good i don't uh i don't get a lot of a lot of time to to come jump on anymore espn has me running around with uh like a chicken with my head cut off sometimes, but you know, uh, that, that's just how the, the world works sometimes when it goes to the saints and, and the linebacking core and everything kind of going on there. Uh, I think Bob put it best. I thank God for DeMario Davis. Um, 
you know, listening through you guys talk as well, I think that when it comes to what we saw against Seattle, the defense, uh, they played a lot better than what the score indicates. Obviously, when you're up 20 points on the road in Seattle, uh, the defensive line, and that's been an issue over the years, right, is, is getting pressure to the quarterback outside of Cam Jordan. And even though Cam didn't get a sack uh, of Russell Wilson, I think Cam Jordan played a phenomenal game. He did. I think the defensive line has done a great job over the first three weeks of the season. And remember, that was kind of a question mark as well with, with some of the injuries up front, obviously with Rankins and Onyemata missed the first the first week. Uh, so the defensive line has done a pretty good job. The defensive backfield still some question marks. But I feel like the last two or three years, defensive backfield has been question marks the first couple of weeks and all of a sudden – week four week five rolls around and they kind of get everything put together so I'm, I'm hoping for the same there the linebackers is tough because you don't you don't know who's going to step up behind demario davis you don't know what you're going to get out of klein week in week out and i remember signing klein and uh, he played really really well as luke keekley's backup in carolina mm-hmm. somebody could step in but the knock has always been sideline to sideline. He's not a guy that can can go sideline to sideline. Um, Kiko Alonso, I'm not sure how many snaps he got against Seattle. I know that was a guy that was traded for to provide some depth. And I don't think he's ready to sit there and get some serious snaps, but it might be someone who you look at. But again, that's another guy who isn't great in coverage, isn't great sideline to sideline. So you, you have some weak spots on the defensive side. However, I feel like outside of that fourth quarter when you're playing a little more conservative and the defensive backs lay off a little bit, the defense played very well. My concern actually lies to the fact that even though Alvin Kamara had what many could argue is the best all-around game he's had in his young NFL career is – At one point in that game, he had 52% of the offensive touches. Mm -hmm. And you spend a a good bit of money on a guy like Latavius Murray in the offseason. And I say a good bit of money. It comes out to be, I think, $4 million a year. Where was he in that game? How do you work Latavius Murray over the next couple of weeks? Because if you're going to come out with a similar game plan, that you did offensively with Seattle, which I think Teddy Bridgewater got a lot more situated as the game went on, and that's always a really good thing to see. But you can't have Alvin getting 25 to 30 touches uh, week in and week out because if you guys already think as fans that losing Drew is a big deal, could you imagine even Kamara getting just a little knock but that well, was due to the offense? And that's a great point. If we remember the first four games of last season due to Mark Ingram's suspension, Kamara was used heavily for the Saints. And he was a little worn the next couple of games after it. You you noticed that. Um, he, here's the deal. When Murray gets onto the field, nine times out of ten, what's it going to be? A run play. Right. What Sean Payton's going to have to do if Murray gets on the field, he's going to have to mix it up. Now, he did do it one time where he tried to screen to Murray. Right. But the other times, most of the times when Murray gets onto that field, I think he only had 12 offensive snaps for the game. That's it. Alvin Kamara, he had, let's see, 51 offensive snaps plus one special team snap. So it was. Latavius Murray is not getting acclimated into the system because every time he gets into the system, he's not really being as effective as necessary, right? So we're going to have to rely a little bit more on the ground, I I believe. And and Bob, I kind of text this to you as well. Remember during the game, they're going to have to put some pressure on that Dallas uh, defense. The Dallas defense, early on in the game, usually those guys are flying to the ball. They like to tee off. But the way you neutralize that, if you pound a guy and you suck and you hit him in the, in the gut <laughs> enough times, they kind of soften <laughs> them up a little bit. 
The Saints have to be able to do that. Man, and you can tell we miss Mark Ingram all so much, but Murray is here. We're going to have to do something about it. He can't be all, all Alvin Kamara like you said, Brendan. It has to be some change-up somewhere, Bob. Yeah, and I, I'm like you guys. I would like to see uh, more alignments with both Murray and Kamara in the lineup, uh, not only in the lineup, uh, but perhaps even in the same backfield. Uh, it, it, when uh, I don't remember which one of you gentlemen pointed out uh, the couple of snaps that they were both on the field at the same time, uh, Kamara was lined up out wide. Uh, yeah, not that not that any of us mind seeing Kamara, uh, Alvin Kamara, uh, run a pass pattern into the opposing secondary. Uh, but even if both men are on the field at the same time, it could perhaps leave the opposing defense. And you know, this week in, uh, in the case of Dallas. Uh, leave the opposing defense a little bit off balance because who are they going to, who's the defense going to key on, uh, you know, when Alvin Kamara and Latavius Murray are both on the field, my money's on Kamara and, you know, at Dallas already proved last year that they have the athletes in the linebacking court to match up with him or at least contain him. Uh, that's where the Saints will have the opportunity to pound the ball between the tackles. Maybe it's with Alvin, and we, you know, we know that Alvin has the capability of doing that, but that's where you would like to see Murray get some more touches, uh, get him into a little bit of a rhythm, uh, let the Saints establish a little bit of physicality, uh, and, and they've done that. Uh, they were able to do it in the second half against Houston. They were, they were able to maintain a physical edge most of the game against Seattle. Uh, but when they do it, there's nothing wrong with establishing a physical tone with Latavius Murray as your running back just to give Kamara a breather. Uh, and I'm not saying necessarily on the sidelines a breather, uh, just so that way he's not the focal point of the offense on every single play, uh, you know, whether it's a run, uh, or a short pass situation. And I, I saw a couple people sort of put out a little bit of a poll on social media, both Facebook and Twitter, uh, you know, which Saints offseason addition is more disappointing to you at this point? Is it Jared Cook or Latavius Murray? Uh, and, you know, we'll get into Cook in a minute, but I contend that, it, that you could make a strong case for Murray, uh, again, because, you know, like you guys pointed out, he's been unable to get into any kind of a rhythm within this offense. Uh, maybe it was the lack of preseason reps. Uh, you know, maybe it's the way he's being used early in the games. Uh, because he is the kind of back, and we, you know, we know that Sean isn't going to give the ball to him 20 or 25 times a game. Uh, that's just not what his role is going to be with the New Orleans Saints. Uh, but you would like to see Murray involved in even eight to ten plays. Most of them are going to be carries. Uh, but he can be a playmaker with the ball in his hands. Well, uh, we just haven't seen that yet. Here, here's my opinion. When Sean finally found out, just like what happened with Mark Ingram, re remember when Mark would get into the game, defenses would tee off, put more into the box, eight into the box, and they knew a running play possibly was coming in. It wasn't until he was able to show that he could be able to handle the screen plays that yes. he started to evolve as a running back and became more all around. So when you had either Kamara in the backfield or if you had Ingram in the backfield, you had two guys that could be able to demonstrate the uh, the potential to either catch the ball or run the ball, right? So until Latavius Murray is able to break one, a couple, offer screen passes, then that's when these guys are going to take more of a, a stance. Let's see what Latavius Murray is going to bring. Is it going to be – is because right now, most of the times it's, it's going to be a run play, Right. The, the concern I have here is that you have Murray, you have Zach Line, right? And I think he got injured a little bit yesterday as well. So Dwayne Washington was ready. He was dressed. We didn't see him at all, okay? 
what's going to happen, let's say Murray doesn't perform, keeps diminishing his ability to be effective on offense for the New Orleans Saints. So what's going to happen going forward? You know, so they're going to have to get him more involved in this game coming up. And look, Bridgewater's longest pass was 29 yards, but that was off of a screen pass to right. Alvin Kamara that went for the touchdown. The next longest pass he had was to uh, Michael Thomas, 18 yards, another 18 yards to Kamara. The Saints are going to have to take some shots down the field to open up those defenses as well. The offensive line did a great job yesterday keeping him upright. Sometimes he was getting some pressure, but he's going to have to take some chances. And I've seen that uh, quite a bit, in my opinion, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, it looked like he was a little bit hesitant to take those bigger shots. What's your thoughts there, Brendan? Well, like I said earlier, I feel like he got more comfortable as the game went on. But you look at Teddy over the course of his collegiate career. You look at early on, including the Pro Bowl nod in 2015. And he's not a guy that goes and takes a lot of deep shots down the field. And I'd make the argument, too, that over the years, the last few years at least, Drew Brees has been become a guy who doesn't take nearly as many shots as he used to, and that's fine. But the difference here is the shots that Drew would take eight out of ten times, maybe seven out of ten times, resulted in a big play. And I think that as Saints fans and some people who have watched Drew Brees play as much as they have, your back's itching a little bit because you just want to see the chance happen. Now, in the case of the Seattle game, with how hard it was raining throughout the game, I understand maybe the play calling, whether it was the play calling or whether it was Teddy Bridgewater's decision to not push it downfield because of the weather conditions. But I would really like to see one or two shot plays uh, against Dallas next week. You're in the dome. Uh, It's going to be loud. It's going to be a good environment. Obviously, you're going to have the whole Houdet Nation there on your side. And like I said, it's a dome. You don't got to worry about any weather conditions. Uh, the one positive I'll take from, from Teddy's performance, whether he was hesitant, whether he was just trying to get a feel for an offense, the, the positive is I felt like the longer the game went, the more it became Teddy Bridgewater's game and his style of play. Um, so that's the positive I'll take. And the other thing you have to note is, is – If you listened or watched any of his interviews uh, after the game, he talked about how emotional it was for him. Remember back in uh, the summer of 2016 when you had that gruesome leg injury? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people forget that there was a rumor and a rumor that ends up being – has some truth to it. I can't confirm that it's 100% true, but because of how gruesome that injury was, there was a moment there where they had to tell Teddy that there was a chance he was going to lose his leg sure was um, was. because of how bad that injury was so to to go from there (laughs) to starting a meaningful game obviously you got the the nod in week 17 last year where the division was locked up but to go from there right after your pro bowl season you having a lot of success and of course the offensive rookie of the year as well to have that injury be told you might not just never play football again but you might lose your leg Mm -hmm. to being able to come back and play in a meaningful game I'm sure there was a lot of emotion there so you put that on top of the fact that you weren't supposed to start that game on top of the fact that you do have to change the offense to an extent uh, for Teddy Bridgewater opposed to Drew Brees there's a lot of factors going in in that first in that first quarter and then into the second quarter as well but that second half, I felt like the offense kind of figured it out. And Alvin Kamara said it after the game. He said that Sean had, had preached all week that Teddy is a different type of leader than Drew. But Teddy knows who he is. And the way that he goes about leading is very special and unique. And I think once some of that initial 
oh my god, we're not we're playing a game without Drew Brees leading us, and we're playing a game where the play calling is going to be different. Everything's going to be a little different. Kind of got out of everybody's system. They looked better offensively, and even though there weren't a whole lot of moments where you went, oh my god, big play. And at times, it, the offense looked stagnant. I think they did enough. And I would be the first one to tell you guys, I was really, really happy with Teddy's play in that game against Seattle. And it's a great thing to start building on. But yes, you want to see more shots taken downfield. But at the same time, as many fans are itching for some similar excitement to what we get from Drew. You have to remember the style of plays changed and Teddy's going to do what he has to do. And he doesn't just have to manage the game. He has to do a little bit more than that, but you're going to see a little bit more conservative. You're going to see some more Alvin Kamara. And from here on, however long it is until Drew comes back, let's not put it past him to come back before the six weeks. Uh, this, this Teddy Bridgewater led Saints team, is going to look different. We had a weird taste in our mouths for getting our first glimpse of life after Drew. And though it might have not been the easiest medicine to go down, for lack of a better term, it was a win. They executed the game plan. And after something like that, and a confidence builder for everyone on that offense, you're able to plug away a little bit more this week and then a little bit more next week and add more and more to where it does run a little more like a well-oiled machine and not something that was kind of thrown together a little quicker than you hoped and then just pushed out of the driveway and see what happens. Right, right. I agree. I concur. Um, Okay, Bobo, what's next? Uh, Well, I want to expound a little bit on what you guys said about Bridgewater. Uh, yeah, and I agree with you, Brendan. He played uh, he played exactly within himself, uh, which is what this team needed him to do yesterday. Uh, and you're right. A lot of people didn't even stop to think that this was his first meaningful start since 2015. And I can only imagine the emotion that was going through that young man's head uh, after everything he went through just to get back onto the field. Uh, you know, for fans that are listening right now, if you don't know the Teddy Bridgewater history, uh, you know, go- Google it and look it up. Uh, you'll you'll have a new admiration for this man. I trust I, I trust me when I say that. Uh, and not only the emotion that was going through Bridgewater's head, uh, but also through every single Saints member on that field, uh, because this was their first meaningful game as New Orleans Saints without Drew Brees at quarterback. Uh, and whether whether or not they trust Teddy Bridgewater and had confidence in tre- Teddy Bridgewater, that's almost irrelevant because you don't have a Hall of Fame quarterback back there. Uh, a, a Hall of Fame, a legend like Drew Brees can cover up for a lot of miscues as we have seen over the years. Uh, and I thought Teddy did play a sharp game. Uh, and you know, look back, if you're able to, look back at the film and especially uh, – pay close attention to the Saints' final drive of the second quarter and their opening drive of the third quarter. They scored those touchdowns because of how well Bridgewater threw the football. Uh, you know, he, he was sharp. Uh, he was extremely decisive with his decision-making, which has been a knock on him through his career, uh, and that's been a knock that I've had on him too. Uh, not that he makes poor decisions, uh, but almost that he doesn't – he's afraid to make mistakes. Uh, and he can be a victim of paralysis by analysis. Uh, now, we know he isn't Drew Brees. Nobody is Drew Brees. Uh, what makes Brees so special is, like you pointed out, Brandon, over the, you know recent years, we have, still have seen Drew take deep shots, uh, but they weren't quite the same as what we saw even three or four or five years ago. Uh, you know, they, they, were more, they were more measured. Uh, what Drew is able to do maybe better than any quarterback that's ever played the game is get the ball to his playmakers in positions to make plays uh, with them on the move. And as Teddy gets more comfortable, not only in this system out on, to, uh, on the field, uh, but also in himself, 
uh, we're going to start to see some of those plays. Uh, you know, we were seeing a little bit of confidence in, you know, in his own abilities through those two drives that I mentioned. Uh, he was getting the ball. You know, he, he threw a really sharp pass again. Uh, you know, two extremely sharp passes uh, to Michael Thomas. Got Jared Cook involved a little bit, uh, and you know, really had this team on the move. And now that this is out of their system, and again, such a tough environment in Seattle, uh, you know, then you throw in the weather conditions on top of that. Now you're coming home. You have the win under your system. Everybody can look at each other in that locker room, and now they all they thought that they could do it. Now they know they can do it without Drew. Uh, and they're, i got to believe that they're going to come into this Dallas game riding a wave of confidence. Um, and, you know, with that super dumb crowd behind them, if they can make a few plays early on, uh, especially offensively, uh, you will I agree with you, Brendan. I, I would like to see them take a deep shot or two uh, because Dallas and the upcoming defenses that are going to be on their schedule, they aren't necessarily going to respect the potential big play down the field like they would with Drew in the lineup. Teddy's got to make them pay. He has got to make them pay. Uh, and that's going to back everything off. And, you know, the, the offensive production is going to take a big jump when you see that. I agree. Look, you've got to – I know you say make it make them pay, but you've got to have the change-up, right? You have to have a change-up. And the change-up as a quarterback is a shot every now and then and then down the field. Uh, I listened, uh, Teddy Bridgewater said that when he was texting Drew Brees through the week, and Drew Brees said, uh, don't af- be afraid to make the completion. <laughs> he said, that, just make the completion. And that's a good thing, you know, to make the completion. And looks like he took heed to that. Now, let's turn everything to the, uh, the trenches, man. Uh, the Saints are going to go against the Dallas Cowboys, and let's talk about the Saints' uh, offensive line against the Cowboys' defensive line. What's going to be the keys there for the team uh, against the Cowboys on Sunday night there, Brendan? Well, let's start right where you said in the trenches. Uh, Ryan Ramchek has played a phenomenal first three weeks of 2019. Uh, he gets a, a really dangerous pass rusher um, this upcoming week. Uh, a guy that was actually a Saints target in, in the draft a couple years ago in Demarcus Lawrence. And um, I think it starts right there. I think with this team, and we've talked about Teddy so much. Um, and I think another thing we, we, we kind of failed to bring up in that little bit of discussion with Teddy Bridgewater is – we're not throwing a, a, a really savvy vet out there um, to, to fill the shoes of Drew Brees. Let's not forget that Teddy Bridgewater is only 26, and you take some meaningful years out, and he, he's only been in the league a few years, and he's still figuring out things for himself in the league. But you got to protect the guy up front against uh, a really athletic, a really fast uh, a defense that can really spread the field. Their linebackers have no problem going sideline to sideline. Uh, they're a really fun defense to watch when everything's clicking. I think it starts right there in terms of keys to, to winning the game. I think the defense of line, who's played very well in the first three weeks, is going to have a, a really tough test against what a lot of people argue is the best offensive line in football. You know, they said it at the end of the, the broadcast, uh, Tony Romo and Jim Nance did against Seattle, is that one thing that was the Saints defense did really well last year was stopping the run. And they brought that up on some of those fourth down stops as well. Ezekiel Elliott's a different monster. So stopping the run's going to be big, forcing Dak to throw the football. And we just talked about Teddy Bridgewater, and we talked about how not a lot of shot plays, and, and Kyle just said, don't be afraid just to take the completion. I feel like Dak Prescott's a very similar guy if you want to look that way, manages the game, does a little bit more than just manages and managing the game, makes some big plays, but I'd rather be in Dak's hands than Zeke's hands, especially with the game uh, on the line. When I say on the line, I, I mean some of those little things that, that go unnoticed. I'm not necessarily talking about a two minute drill or, you know, making a big play before the half, but like those final eight minutes, 
of the first half, those final eight minutes um, of the second half. I'd much rather see Dak have to push the ball downfield than have the ball in Zeke's hands with the ability to make plays. It's going to be a tough matchup. Uh, Dallas is no pushover team. I think there's a lot of NFL fans that like to, to make jokes about the Dallas Cowboys and, <laughs> and give them some hate when uh, when things don't go their way. I think that's just a normal thing, but this isn't a team that's – you know, going to go like four and 12 or a team that's going to go seven and nine. You know, when the Cowboys are clicking on all cylinders, remember just a few years ago, they were 13 and three. They were a really good football team. Well, so I think it starts. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. No, I just think it starts right there. Uh, both sides of the football, the defensive line still got to apply pressure to Dak like they've done to the three quarterbacks they've seen the first three weeks of the season. I think that stopping the run is going to be key. Obviously, it's not about stopping Zeke. It's about containing Zeke. And then the offensive line's got to give, whether it's Teddy in the pocket or whether it's Latavius Murray between the tackles or Alvin Kamara between the tackles, uh, you got to give them some room to work. And on the outside, when you're stretching the field, whether with uh, with Kamara or whether you're running a five-yard out pattern, you got to make sure that uh, you recognize matchups with linebackers. So I think it starts right there in the trenches, and you got to win those matchups with linebackers. And, and I think the latter of that, winning the matchups with the linebackers, uh, that's probably the more difficult thing to do. Correct. And look, guys, you got Zeke, but the threats that I'm concerned with, Bob, is Cooper, Randall Cobb, and I think Gallup is a little banged up. But Devin Smith has proven to be pretty good young wide receiver. How do you think our defensive backfield is going to hold up against these guys? Uh, well, you know, not that we root for anybody to be injured, uh, but to expound on your point, Kyle, Michael Gallup is going to miss this game. Uh, you know, they're saying anyway, uh, he just had a, uh, a scope done on his knee, uh, and he's, he's supposedly going to be out two to four weeks. Uh, which it kind of slides everybody up the depth chart. Uh, Amar, that, that receiving game for Dallas goes through Amari Cooper, uh, and he has put up some mind-blowing statistics uh, since he joined the Cowboys down the stretch last season. Uh, he is Dak's go-to guy, uh, and he delivers time and time and time again. Uh, Amari Cooper does not get enough credit through league circles uh, for how good he really is. Uh, Randall Cobb, and we've seen him before in a Green Bay Packer uniform. We know what kind of playmaker he is in the open field. Uh, and Devin Smith might not be the receiver that Michael Gallup is, uh, but you're right, Kyle. He will beat you deep, uh, which is exactly where the Saints secondary has struggled, uh, you know, at times last season, and we've seen it at times this season as well. Uh, he, so the, you know, the Saints' pass defense, their success starts up front and the pressure that they get on the quarterback. Uh, like, you, uh, like you both pointed out, uh, yeah, and it's going to be a tall task against the very formidable Dallas front five uh, on their offensive line. Uh, but remember, the Saints got Prescott to the ground to the tune of seven sacks in last year's matchup. Uh, Onyemata and Cam... Uh, combined for five sacks, and they had Dak under pressure all night. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, when they didn't get him to the ground, he completed 24 out of 28 passes. Uh, he is a very sharp quarterback when he's given time to find his guys. Uh, and, you know, uh, Amari Cooper, you would think Lattimore is going to be locked up on him. Um, so that's going to be a must-win battle for the state secondary. Uh, but Eli Apple and T.J. Williams, uh, are both going to have to contain the big plays down the field uh, and make sure that they don't get beat badly by Devin Bush, who has game-breaking speed, and Randall Cobb, who's a veteran and you know, still possesses some wonderful athletic ability and is a seasoned receiver. Um, you know, that's where you're going to see the safeties, Von Bell and Marcus Williams, be really put to the test. Uh, but again, you know, just like any quarterback, if Dak Prescott is rushed and hurried, that's really going to help the Saints on the back end. Uh, you know, so the, the key is going to be the pressure up front. Uh, can they stop the run, uh, the Saints we're talking about? Uh, you're right, Brendan. You know, Zeke, if he's not the best back in the NFL, 
uh, he's the second or third name out of everybody's mouth. Uh, and he, yeah, that's probably pushing it. Uh, I've always been a fan of Ezekiel Elliott since his Ohio State days. Uh, and we just talked about how good the Dallas offensive line is. Uh, but this Saints defense, they might not be performing against the run as well as we saw them do last year. Uh, and Seattle, if you look at the stat sheet, Seattle rushed for 109 yards, uh, but 51 of those were off of the legs of Russell Wilson. And we know what he can do. You take that, you take Wilson's running out uh, and the Seattle running backs combined for 19 carries and 58 yards. That's what we saw out of the Saints defense last year. Uh, you know, and last week, we know how big that they came up on third and short and fourth and short. Uh, they're going to have to win those wars up front against Dallas again this time around because you know, as a talented as Amari Cooper is and as pretty as stat line as Dak Prescott has put up over the season's first three weeks, that off that Dallas offense still runs through the ability of Ezekiel Elliott on the ground, and he's a, an accomplished receiver too. Uh, so, it, you know, it is – as key as the battle is going to be between Alvin Kamara and the very talented Dallas linebackers, it's going to be just as entertaining to see Zeke Elliott take on Demario Davis. Uh, and hopefully that's the matchup that we get rather than, you know, AJ Klein. Uh, you know, so that's, that's going to be the key, obviously, for the Saints defense is the war up front, uh, and containment on the back end of both Elliott and Amari Cooper. Uh, now switching the sides, uh, off, off to the other side. The Saints offensive line did not perform well against the Dallas defensive front seven last year. We already know that. Uh, you know, Saints were held at just 10 points. Uh, but remember, folks, we, I, I know Teron Armstead was out, uh, but if I'm not mistaken, they had already, uh, they had also lost Jermon Bushrod as well. So they were down to their third string tackle or uh, moving Pete outside and bringing in a backup at the guard position. Either way, the Saints line was a shell of what we're norm normally used to seeing. Uh, and I'm knocking on wood when I'm saying this. Uh, the Saints come into this game extremely healthy on the offensive line. Uh, and other for that, uh, outside of that struggle that they had against the Rams two weeks ago, they played really well against Houston. They played really well all game long against Seattle. Uh, and Dallas has, does have, uh, five sacks on the year. But three of them came last week against Miami. So they have struggled in putting pressure on the passer a little bit. Um, you, know, and, you know, we just talked about if Teddy is given some time, he can settle himself into a groove uh, and, you know, kind of carve apart that defense because Dallas doesn't have, outside of Byron Jones, Dallas doesn't have great cover guys in the secondary. Byron Jones versus Michael Thomas is going to be a key matchup, which comes down again to Ted Ginn, can you get open? Jared Cook, can you get open? Because Alvin Kamara is going to have his hands full uh, with Leighton Vander Esch and uh, Jalen Smith, who combined for, I believe it was 18 or 19 tackles last year against New Orleans. So we know how active those guys can be. Uh, but again, if the New Orleans can win the battle up front on offense as well, they're going to dictate the pace of the game, which you need to do with Teddy Bridgewater, at quarterback. Yes. Dak has been a different quarterback since the arrival of Amari Cooper. I think uh, last stats that Skip Bayless, <laughs> who I love, Skip is a <laughs> he is a Cowboys fan. You got to love that. Uh, he did say that uh, the Saints did have an overrated win against Seattle. So I take issue with that one, Skip, and I'll let him know. But um, – I think Dak has won more games than any other quarterback in the league uh, since Amari Cooper's arrival, even over Tom Brady. So, and uh, that was a pretty interesting stat. And I believe also Dak has <coughs> been better in the fourth quarter than um, most of these guys as well in the league since Amari Cooper's Arrival. So Amari Cooper is going to be the key. Marshawn Lattimore against him. Uh, how that's going to translate uh, into either positive yardage from him, or is are we going to see Marshawn give uh, a good fight like he did against Hopkins early on in the season? So I'm really going to play the key there. But you have a guy like Randall Cobb who is a wily veteran. He knows how to get open. And uh, that concerns me. And we got to also, we can't forget that Dak can run. 
we saw Wilson yeah. run. Dak has that ability as well, and he's much more difficult, in my opinion, to get down because he's longer, bigger, and stronger. Now, uh, Kellen Moore, uh, he's uh, done a great job taking over the play duties. Uh, he's a former quarterback himself of the Cowboys, and now he's uh, <laughs> handling the plays. He's drawing up some really neat plays for those guys, and he has bonded very well with Dak. kind of reminds me of the coaching uh, symbiotical that you have with <laughs> Mr. Uh, Sean Payton, <laughs> Pete Carmichael, and Drew Brees. So, you know, so uh, all in all, I think this Dallas team – you can't find too many, I, I'll say, too many glaring weaknesses, so to speak. And when you have a team, you can't find too many glaring weaknesses. You have to, uh, you have to use your strength against their strength, or you have to take their strength and be a little bit. Uh, different. Uh, so if a guy is much bigger and stronger, you've got to be more agile. And if a guy uh, needs to get kicked in the gut, like I said earlier, you got to hit him in the gut and you got to be willing to take the punch in return. So we'll see how this uh, translates out on the field, guys. And uh, I think the coaching duties is going to be quite different this time because you have also John Kitna, who's the quarterback coach for Dak, so he has two, well, three former quarterbacks, if you have Jason Garrett right on the sidelines helping him out to be able to mature into the quarterback that we see. Now, um, you have Smith on that offensive line for the Cowboys, which last season he did not give up not one sack. And I think that's just outstanding, you know. But we also have two outstanding tackles in Ryan Ramchek as well as Teron Armstead. The key for us is how Pete is going to hold up against Lawrence, uh, against Robert Quinn also because he's coming off a suspension. And last game he had a very productive uh, game uh, against uh, Miami. So – the argument can be said, Brendan, and argument can be said, Bob, that Dallas really hasn't played anyone significant. They played yep. Miami. They played the Redskins. They played the Giants. But you're going into a hostile environment inside of our Superdome, and the fans remember what happened last season when we went to uh, the big house up there in Arlington and came away with a loss. So I think this is going to be a, a really energetic game. It's going to be one of those games that uh, we're really going to see a lot of passion and energy out on the field. But we've got to be smart, and the defense has to be able to play smart football, in especially those defensive backs. Okay, Brendan, how do you see this uh, translating out on the field? Uh, what's your, your predictions? I'd like to be positive for a lot of the points you just made in terms of Dallas hasn't really played anybody. It's a hostile environment. And in the back of your mind, you have to think about last year. And another thing is Drew Brees should be on the sideline this weekend. Yeah. And I think Drew physically being there is going to bring <laughs> another element uh, to the Saints and that sideline. And of course, the fans there. Uh, just to, to show Drew some love. You know he's going to get on that big screen early and often. So I'd like to say that the fans really helped the Saints ride this wave of momentum out of Seattle. Uh, Teddy being more acclimated to the offense in a second week starting. I think it's going to be a tight one, but I like the Saints in this one. I'm going to go 27-24 go New Orleans. All right. Good, good. Bobo, what's your thoughts, buddy? I, listen, I, I I know there aren't too many NFL teams uh, that can boast the offensive tackle talent at each end uh, like the Saints can with Armstead and Ramchek. 
but Dallas, Dallas comes a close second uh, with Smith and Collins at either at either bookend. Uh, I'll still take Cam Jordan. Uh, you, know, you, you know he's going to play well uh, no matter the environment. He is just that good to bring it in week in and week out. Uh, but, but folks, you know, lost in the how well the Saints defensive line as a group is playing is can we talk about Marcus Davenport and how well he is playing? Yes. Uh, he actually leads the team in quarterback hits. Uh, he hasn't registered a sack yet, uh, but he is becoming – uh, starting to become the disruptive force that we all hoped he would be uh, when the Saints moved up in the draft to get him. Uh, now, he, he is likely going to be matched up against Tyron Smith most of the night, uh, but as long as he can at least break dead even uh, and give Smith a handful to perhaps uh, you know, take the attention away from uh, the, the left guard, Connor Williams, uh, that that'll leave the interior open, and we know how well Anya Mata played against Dallas last year. Um, Malcolm Smith and Shai Tuttle continue to play well uh, you know, also. Uh, and I know we talked about the battles up front and it being the key. Uh, I just wanted to highlight how well Davenport was playing and how that can kind of have a trickle down effect uh, for the rest rest of the Saints defensive line if he continues to do so. Uh, as far as and I agree with you, Brendan. Uh, you know, let's not discount the fact that Drew Brees and the emotional level that is, you know, he's going to bring when he is back on that sideline. Uh, he is just another support system for Teddy Bridgewater along that sideline as well. Uh, the New Orleans crowd is going to be really, really, really behind this team. Uh, and, guys, we have a coach named Sean Payton who – he kind of has an extra chip on his shoulder whenever these Saints play the Cowboys. Uh, now, there's a variety of reasons why, uh, but Peyton teams usually play very, very well uh, in a national TV spotlight at home, uh, which this one, of course, is. Uh, because the Saints are riding such a high wave of momentum, uh, and I feel like this win in Seattle did so much for their confidence uh, you know, as, as a unit, uh, especially without Breeze in the lineup, uh, that that's going to bolster them through this game. Uh, you know, you're right, Brendan. You know, the, the Cowboys' talent across the board can't be discounted. Uh, they are one of the more talented starting units anyway. I question their depth a little, but you know, starting units on each side of the ball. Uh, you know, so they're going to give the Saints a battle, and I think that this one's going to be close throughout. Uh, but the Cowboys have not really been pushed to the limit by anybody yet this season, like you pointed out, Kyle. Uh, they had games well in hand early uh, against the Giants and Washington. Uh, and, you know, my, Miami should be abolished from the league for the, for the year of 2019 for what they're doing. So that, that was an easy victory for them. Uh, so to come into New Orleans without really, really having been tested, uh, I think, you know, this Saints team is going to make them bring it to win. Uh, and I just like, I love the intensity uh, that Demario Davis and his defense is uh, you know, coming with. Alvin Kamara is on a roll. Uh, so I can see the Saints, uh, I know it's early in the week, folks. Uh, I can see the Saints pulling out a tight one, 24 to 21 on Sunday night football. Yes. I, I got the Saints 34 to 31. And uh, I think it's going to come down to Mr. Will Lutz kicking a clutch field goal at the end of the game for the Saints. Um, guys, don't forget, man, Eric McCoy at center has been playing an outstanding, outstanding uh, game at center mm -hmm. uh, for the rookie. I really like what I see in him. And, uh, these guys want to keep on taking us out. But uh, i tell you this much, guys. It's going to be a, a very spirited game, and I know the uh, Dallas Cowboys are going to come with their faithful to New Orleans, and it's going to be a lot of energy inside the Mercedes-Benz Superdome on Sunday night. Bobo, tell everybody how they can follow you on the World Wide Web. Well, uh, we do appreciate everybody tuning in for this special broadcast of the Bayou Blitz tonight. Uh, and we always want to thank you guys, every single one of you, for your love and your support. 
Uh, Brandon, I'm so glad you had an opportunity to join us. Yes. Uh, it's been too long, my friend. we got to get caught up more often. Yeah, yeah. And, and how's everything with Gardner Webb? Man, it's awesome. Uh, we finalized a contract extension, per se, which Good. puts me at 70 events on ESPN Plus this year covering Big South Conference. Uh, so that was a big deal to be renewed on the ESPN family and network. So uh, everything's good. I do three different events this week, uh, women's soccer on Wednesday, and I do two volleyball games over the weekend. Uh, I am the analyst for home football for Gardner Webb on ESPN plus as well. Uh, so everything's rolling. And then basketball season starts at Gardner Webb real soon. The defending big South champs remember gave uh, Virginia a scare in the yes. NCAA tournament. Yeah. last year so a lot of lot of really good things happening uh really thankful for all that and i can't forget and the listeners can't forget that there was a guy uh by the name of Derek stevens who gave me a chance to to be on this network at a at a young age i think i was a sophomore in college when that happened and here she i am was, yeah like four years later uh on the espn family and network so Big thanks to, to Kyle, of course, and, and Derek, who's looking down, because if it weren't for an opportunity just to talk about Saints football, you know, who knows where I'd be at right now. Yeah, man, I'm proud of you, man. Just keep up the great work. And as the professor will say, you have the propensity and proclivity to do great things. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, and – Look, guys, don't forget, you can follow Bob on Canal Street Chronicles with all his great articles. You can also can uh, follow us at www.saintspodcast.com where we have all the podcasts of the Who Dat Nation in one spot. And you can be able to follow Barry Hurstus and his featured columns on www.saintsnewsnetwork.com. Com and uh, please continue to support us and hopefully we'll have some more great uh, dialogue with you guys next week I will be out of commission for the rest of the week Bob and uh, we will be back on the air on next Wednesday night to talk about the Saints defeating the Dallas Cowboys in the Mercedes Benz Superdome on Sunday all right, guys, uh, any last words, Bob? Any last words, Brendan? I guess that's I'll all. Just, <laughs> go I'll go, I was going to say, I, I guess I'll go ahead and throw it out. Uh, Twitter, my Twitter's at BT Boylan. That's B-T-B-O-Y-L-A-N. Uh, find me on ESPN Plus with the Gardner Webb running Bulldogs. And as uh, as Bob said, it, it's been it's been too long. Honestly, I think the last time I was able to call in was week one of last year. Oh wow! Against Tampa Bay, we did a <laughs> halftime show. Yeah, yeah, um, that sure was. Yeah, I've I've, uh, I've been quite busy over the last year, uh, but finally situated in some things. So hopefully, it won't be too long. And uh, just to piggyback off Bob and, and Kyle. Uh, appreciate the support, whether it's for the Saints News Network, whether you followed any one of us involved in this circle uh, into different endeavors. Uh, it's great to have the love and support that I still get shown from you guys, uh, Saints fans, even well past the days where I was on the network week in and week out. Man, you always are going to be family. You know that. Uh, yes. Whatever you need, I'm always going to be here to help support you. All right. But if you need money, call Bob. Um, just say that. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, and tell your mom we say hello as well as your lady friend. Uh, Bobo, any last thoughts? I, you guys both, as always, put everything so eloquently uh, that all I can really do is stand here and look pretty. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but yeah, you know, seriously, we we do love all you guys for your support uh, of our show, uh, of us as individually, um, and you know, obviously of our of our New Orleans Saints. As uh, Mr. Mosley is fond of putting it, uh, we are all family. Uh, that trickles down through the Who Nation of fans. 
uh, those of us that have been fortunate enough to cover the team in some way, shape, or form, uh, or those like uh, our friend and family member Brendan Boylan, who's branched out and covered Gardner Webb. Uh, follow his work, folks. He does outstanding work uh, in every sport that he covers, and he keeps himself pretty busy. I, I, I'm, I'm too old to do what you do. you do. I don't know how you have the energy, uh, but uh, I think it goes without saying, Brendan, that you are anytime you are free, we would love for you to join us. No, oh, absolutely will, absolutely will, and I don't know how I do it either. Uh, ten, ten <laughs> collegiate sports over the course of uh, like eight to ten months. That's wow. it's something I've had to I've had to really adjust to over the last couple of years, but I love it. It's great. I love it. All right, yeah. man. You know you're gonna be going on to some bigger and better things. Uh, hey, don't forget to reach out to Miss Dabney Henderson over there at the New Orleans Saints production. She, crew uh she's the vp of production now uh we know her as nola chick and uh, i was able to yep. have her on with us many times before as well as interview her one-on-one when she took the job over at the nfl network and uh there's one other thing i'm going to say i'm gonna put it out there i know uh some people may hate what i'm about to say uh be- but before i say that uh you were listening to uh, a gentleman called Let's see. I A T M talk. <laughs> Take a little cash. <laughs> so his uh little anthem there that we were playing was called Yes Indeed Saints Mix. So check him out on SoundCloud I A T M. That's what he goes under, and uh, it's a pretty nice little mix. I like it. it has a good little New Orleans bounce to it. Um. We are Saints fans. Everybody in the Saints in the Who That Nation, of course, you're going to have your opinion, who you like, who you don't like. And uh, Teddy Bridgewater performed very, very well. Uh, is he going to perform very well every week? Hopefully. There's going to be some times where other people need to pick up the slack. We as Saints fans need to support whoever our coach Sean Payton puts out there. Of course, we get a chance to analyze and criticize and – and do what we do as fans, but before a person takes the field, at least give them a chance to go out and show what they can or cannot do. All right. Uh, and as also, I've been, this is my 10th season as head of the Saints News Network. And through all of these seasons, we have helped at least 20 plus people to. A few like Brendan and uh, Kevin, young guys go on to have great careers out there in the world as other people doing some great things. I've hosted some great podcasts over the years with John Hendricks, Deuce, and those guys, Brian and B enemy. Uh, names go on and on and on. Rick Gailey, the professor, blah, 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 blah. Let's keep it classy, guys. We can't keep trashing people. Everybody's different. Everybody's got their little different taste about who they like, who they don't like. Doesn't mean that just because you can trash somebody that makes you any better. What makes us better is we stand together and be able to respect one another. And let's continue to respect one another if we are truly a part of the Who That Nation and believe in our boys in black and gold. This is Kyle T. Mosley, Saints News Network. You can check us out on Twitter at Saints News, Facebook at Saints News, and Instagram at Saints News. So give us a follow. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Brendan. Let's go, Saints. Let's bring home another win on Sunday. Take care and who that. Yeah.